without further ado, we want to go ahead and dive into this. So right now, um, for diversity and inclusion, we've got a great talk coming up right now. Um, these are three talks. Uh, we've first got uh, Paula, who's going to be coming up, um, then Corinne and Shreya. So let's go ahead and jump into things. Um, Paula, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us about what you're going to be doing? You are muted, Paula. You muted again. You unmuted and then you muted. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Awesome. Um, so hi, my name is Paula. I'm a Philadelphia-based artist and activist from Argentina. Um, just a little bit about myself. I uh, am have been doing activism and art for a very long time since I was 14. I was one of the original participants at Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I've had my artwork all over the world, including in galleries in Vienna, Sweden, and Luxembourg. I've given speaking engagements also in a lot of countries. One of my, the last things that I did was before the pandemic, um, is setting up a panel discussion at Tate Modern through the Tate Exchange Program at Plymouth College of Art. Um, and in there I brought in um, all of the people that I look up to most and had them all sit down in a room and talk to each other. So that was great. Um, and yeah, so that's uh, about me. And uh, do, should I just start in within the beginning of the talk? I talk, I'd say like yeah. what it's about. So Go ahead. Um, jump in and I will be your timekeeper, I think. Okay, great. So let me just do a screen share, get out of the nail polish page. There we go. Um, Sorry, I'm obsessed with the nail polish. So let's just do a screen share and present. Great. Um, so before I started, I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer. Um, I wanted to warn participants that within the presentation, uh, we're going to be discussing, there's not going to be anything graphic or any like graphic descriptions or anything. Um, but we are going to be talking about activist murder. So that may be disturbing to some viewers. Um, but I've omitted like just really anything that would be traumatizing. Um, so let's go ahead and start. So these are painted portraits of Carlos and Alice. They are among 30,000 civilians disappeared during Argentina's military dictatorship. By layering transparent paintings of individuals who disappeared during the dictatorship, I hope to spark conversation around the human toll behind post-colonial politics. Through this presentation, I will outline new areas of exploration for the series, which involves analyzing the correlation between the disappearances in Argentina, current activist murders, and disappearances in Argentina through art, environmental destruction, and indigenous rights. Carlos was detained on his way to work in 1977. He was just 24. He had a wife and a child. Back then, and keep in mind this was the 70s, he was a passionate feminist who was the type of man who would get up at 4 a.m. to travel to a visha or a slum to feed the poor. Nora Cortinas, his mother, co-founded Madres de Plaza de Mayo, Línea Fundadora, an organization of mothers that searches for their missing children. He has never found, but she has marched every Thursday since 1977. Alice, a French nun in Argentina, was working in the Church of Santa Cruz and was one of the original participants of Madres de Plaza de Mayo. As a nun, she had a strong conviction for social justice and started protesting, knowing that the government could take them at any moment. She disappeared while leaving the Church of Santa Cruz and her body was never found. As a French nun, her case sparked international outrage. The closest president of the Argentine military dictatorship was the Chilean coup. In 1970, Chile democratically elected a socialist president, Salvador Allende, in the middle of the Red Scare. Fearing that Chile would become the next Cuba, the Chilean upper class teamed up with the American military to stage a coup in 1973. Pinochet assumed power in the form of a military dictatorship, which persecuted leftists, socialists, and political critics. His government illegally detained 130,000 individuals, tortured tens of thousands, killed approximately 3,000 individuals, and approximately 1,000 people went missing during the dictatorship. Not letting me go to the next slide. There, nope. Okay, there we go. 
1976 coup in Argentina followed the Chilean coup. The justification for the dictatorship was that radical extremists were engaging in violence, but declassified government records tell another story. Less than 10% of detainees were suspected of participating in, in violent action. Instead, the government targeted activists, socialists, leftists, community organizers, and even academics. 30,000 individuals like Carlos and Alice were disappeared. Babies born in detention were adopted and appropriated by families sympathetic to the dictatorship. To demand answers to the disappearances of their missing children, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo organized and marched every week. In addition, a sister organization, Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, was established to find their missing appropriated grandchildren. The Madres and Abuelas marched every week, regardless of their circumstances. Even after Alice and a dozen other women were disappeared, they continued to fight. Due to their strength, determination, and persistence, marches organized by the Madres combined with international outrage at human rights violations paved the way for the military to step down in 1983, thus ending the dictatorship. My parents attended these marches during the dictatorship. My mother, who was 13 at the time, recalls feeling terrified of being detained. Parents, family, friends, and acquaintances of both of my parents were disappeared. My dad's lifelong friend lost both of his parents, Liliana and Eduardo, when she was just a, a child. They're pictured here. Eduardo was a university physics professor who taught his students about the importance of civic engagement. If the dictatorship was really targeting violent extremists, then why did they take university professors, nuns, community organizers, parents, and children away from their loved ones? Military dictatorships are not unique to Chile or Argentina. Colonization morphed into interventionism in the 20th century, with the U.S. as a major player. Plan Condor was a U.S. organized alliance between the dictatorships in Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. The organization was operational until 1980, although the U.S. has intervened in other countries since, which are depicted in the map, such as the 2009 coup in Honduras. The primary motive for activist disappearances is profit. Today, activists are the main threat of the ability of corporations to destroy the environment, displace indigenous communities, and establish economic policies that increase profits for the ultra-wealthy while exacerbating global poverty. Let's start by looking at Brazil, where Amazon deforestation has increased by 80% due to President Jair Bolsonaro's policies. He has passed bills that facilitate illegal mining in the, in the Amazon, slash funding for environmental protection organizations, and openly praise the genocide of indigenous communities. Today, Brazil's activists are facing major human rights violations. Mario Franco, a Brazilian politician, is one of many activists who has been disappeared or murdered in mysterious circumstances. As a black socialist lesbian politician from a favela, she was a target because she symbolized a strong opposition to the status quo. Two former police officers have been charged in her murder, but questions in her case remain unsolved. Bolsonaro and his allies have publicly praised the Brazilian dictatorship during the 60s. They are currently replacing more than half the members of a commission investigating activist disappearances and murders, thus per perversing the pursuit of justice. I would be interested to see how biolabs can engage with the correlation between deforestation in the Amazon indigenous rights. Uh, for example, through portraits of people like Marielle uh, could be created from natural resources currently abused in the Amazon. By merging bio art with portraiture, we may increase audience participation both within and outside of art galleries. Another possibility would be to interpret the forensic evidence for a murder investigation through bio art. As a strong advocate for communities in favelas, Marielle Franco's politics intersect with environmental issues. Favelas and beaches are often scapegoated for environmental problems because residents are living in pollution. Slums in Latin America exist because former slaves displaced indigenous communities and immigrants don't have anywhere else to go. In addition, in Brazil, Argentina, and other countries, we have massive issues with trash pickers, or as we call them in Argentina, cartoneros. Entire families are living by picking recyclables out of the trash. Berta Caceres was an indigenous environmental activist in Honduras who fought for the rights of indigenous people and the dangers of environmental destruction on their native lands. She was killed by several hitmen who were hired after she halted efforts to build a dam. 
Community resistance combined with ample international press coverage paved the way for partial, for, sorry, for partial justice. Several hitmen were sentenced for Berta's murder. However, the individuals who hired the hitman have never been held accountable. In this case, we could create bio art demonstrating how the dam could have destroyed her community. Layering, layering images of her and her community, either with or alongside artwork about the dam, could demonstrate how environmental destruction affects local communities. Berta and Marielle are among thousands, uh, tens of thousands of current disappearances and murders that are likely motivated by political issues in Latin America. In Mexico alone, over a hundred politicians have been killed while in public office since the beginning of the drug war. We are more effective when we organize with communities, organizations, and institutional networks instead of trying to do things on our own. In other words, we need to engage in community organizing or the immobilization of groups to achieve a shared goal. To be effective, we need to reach large and or targeted audiences with our work. We can apply community organizing concepts to art curation with the goal of um, reaching specific audiences. By exhibiting persistent memories at the Embassy of Argentina, I was able to spark conversations about disappearances with government officials. After the exhibition at the embassy, the pieces traveled to Philadelphia City Hall, Tyler School of Art, and Georgian Court University. At Georgian Court, the professors engaged with students in discussions and assignments through the exhibition. By working within an in educational institutions, I reached large numbers of students in a meaningful way. Through portraits of glass, I humanized individuals that are typically viewed as collateral damage. I painted portraits because I couldn't appreciate how this dark period of Argentine history was portrayed. The focus was on the facts and not on the individuals or the impact on their families. I wanted to create portraits from the perspective of someone who would have been disappeared at the time as an activist from Argentina. Glass symbolizes the fragility of memory and life. Transparencies engage with the concept of a disappearance by allowing images to fade in and out based on their environment. Individuals are always present even when they are not seen. By creating an open space for reflection and communication, gallery viewers are offered the unique opportunity from, to examine historical ideas from a new lens. By illustrating a shared perspective, the audience may explore Argentina's dirty war from the viewpoint of the desaparecidos. Glass offers the possibility of multiple layers, such as offering audience participation through their own reflection. Furthermore, through Glass, I hope to capture the invisibility that Latin Americans face as a result of systemic oppression. Moving forward, I'm creating new portraits focusing on exploring the correlation between the Argentine military dictatorship, U.S. interventionalism in Latin America, and or U.S. family detention through art. Immigrant detention practices are remarkably similar to the detention of activists throughout Latin America. Entire families are targeted and dehumanized. Children are appropriated. Women are violated and sterilized. Humans suddenly vanish. Entire communities are criminalized for what, doing what they can to help their families. Their plight is depicted in this public art installation by one of my mentors, Michelle Angela Ortiz. I cannot overstate the importance of engaging with affected communities in all of our efforts. I actually flew back to Argentina after the exhibition and helped paint this banner, knowing that the families of the desaparecidos uh, has been critical in depicting these individuals in a way that honors their existing. Each community is different and has different needs. You need to be able to connect with the, mutant, with the community in a meaningful way to build that trust over time. The main concern of the families of the desaparecidos is keeping the memories alive and talking about the stories so that this never happens again. Right now, most Americans are unaware about the Argentine military dictatorship or the fact that the US intervened. Finding innovative and engaging ways to spark conversations about the dictatorship is important in keeping the conversation alive. Multidisciplinary collaboration may spark new ideas of study and conversation through innovation. Projects such as persistent memories would benefit from working with scientists and policymakers. If I was to develop um, an artist residency at a science lab, I would collaborate with science to develop a bio art driven project about these disappearances. Alongside the project, I would work with students uh, focused on communications, history, and policy change to develop education initiative and examine primary source archives. 
While Argentina's dirty war occurred more than 40 years ago, history repeats itself. Systemic violence persists as a global phenomenon. History reduces people to numbers and collateral damage, facilitating erasure and genocide. Through art, I hope to instigate an awareness of how political decisions affect real people and intersect with the environmental destruction that threatens the ability of humans to survive on this world. In their long search for justice, Madres and Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo have risked their lives to overthrow the Argentine military dictatorship, hold military personnel and politicians accountable, release government documents that have revealed dark truths, and in some cases, recover disappeared individuals. Answers and solutions exist. Creativity, innovation, and collaboration have the potential to find solutions to transform our world. Together, we will achieve justice as long as we persist in our fight for truth. Thank you. And now it's time for Q&A. Thank you so, so much, uh, Paula. That was a really, really powerful um, uh, talk. I think, you know, um, like you said, it's time for Q&A, uh, but let's go ahead and give you some snaps for um, sharing these stories that we don't hear enough about. So let's, uh, Give some snaps to Paula for telling the stories of those who don't get their stories told. Um, so uh, you guys can um, put your questions in chat. You can raise your hand. So let me know um, what you've got. Looks like I've got one coming up. If I can scroll down. Oh, no. Oh, Zoom, you're killing me today. Um, yeah, so I think people think that they were... Um, Really powerful. And you actually answered one of the questions I had, Paula, which is uh, the analogies between what's happening in the US now um, and these stories and these uh, militarization. And um, I think in some ways, um, taking stories away is what's happening. Um, so I'll start it off a little bit. Um, how can, oh, here we go. Here's Corinne. Um, Corinne has a question on the artist registry you imagine in a bio lab. Mm -hmm. So how could a biolab um, residency work with the kind of stories you were telling? Yeah, so I think the forensic evidence is really important. Um, and with a lot of these cases, what gets lost a lot of the time is, you know, the evidence for what happened to them. Um, and that can, uh, on the one hand, be very expensive to analyze hiring a private, like, so when with these individuals, when their families go, when, when their family members go missing, um, it's very difficult to figure out what happened and you're left with all of these questions. I can't imagine how devastating it must be to have your family member go missing and it's extremely expensive to hire a forensic, like a private investigator, for example. Um, so I think with a bio lab, we can actually investigate the evidence and try to figure out what is happening to the to these people, but also present the evidence so that we can analyze it and we can look at it um, and we can, uh, you know, put put that evidence in an exhibition um, so that there's a greater conversation about it that's actually fact-driven. In a lot of these cases, you start losing what the truth is because um, it's just so, there's so much hearsay. There's, so, there's usually so many rumors and it's just very difficult to know, to separate fact from, from fiction, uh, what's evidence, what's just speculation, um, what is just anecdotal. So I think really narrowing it down to the evidence would be very helpful to do within a bio lab. Um, and then the other thing is that mo a lot of these cases are in somehow, in one way or another, related to local environmental issues. So we can do things like taking local materials and like creating these portraits out of them. One of the things that I was really interested in as far as bio art is that um, with these portraits, if I'm painting them myself, it takes forever to paint each portrait. But if there's a way to, you know, from the drawing, then use bio art to um, have the local resources that are available actually create the portraits, then uh, one, I can do more portraits, but also there can be a stronger relationship between the material and what's actually happening to these people. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, hello, Isa. Um, do you want to unmute and actually say your comments um, to Paula? Hello, sure. Uh, 
I said, thank you, Paula. I'm from Brazil, and to tackle the dictatorships combined with bio art is such a strong move. Uh, in the context of bio art, is such like an emerging, uh, um, emerging field with so many opportunities, and to combine the the dictatorship cases in the, mm -hmm. these countries, like from South America, with the bio art is crazy like the much of attention you can get to these problems and to people see that these are questions these are problems that are still here are still present and they're important no one will ever forget what happened so yeah thank you for your talk thank you appreciate it yeah i think that this is um you know as i've said a uh, really big um issue. And I think one of the big things we try to tie in in Biosummit is this idea of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with science, with art, with science communication, um, we're telling stories. You know, community building is about storytelling and shared values. Um, and here, this is, you know, another aspect of storytelling. Um, and again, that idea of challenging um, people here to figure out whose stories are untold in your communities. Um, what advice would you give people um, that you learned uh, during this process, um, Paula? Um, so one of the things that I've recognized is very important. There's several things that I wanted to mention when you asked the question. Um, so number one is to, when you're telling stories, uh, stick to one story. I saw that there was, um, or like one set of stories or one topic. I saw there was a question about Black Lives Matter. And while I do think that's a very important topic, um, I think trying to like merge the two um, might like, that, that might confuse people. And I think it's fine to like start that conversation, like how is this related to what's going on in the US right now with Black Lives Matter? Um, I think that's super important. Um, I, but I think that's a conversation that should happen like within the gallery and not necessarily like within the artwork. So you can talk about that from the artwork, but um, I wouldn't try to like put paintings of the disappeared activists in Argentina next to Black Lives Matter protesters um, because I think the relationship might not be so direct. Um, the other thing that, um, I wanted to say around that matter. I think that's why it's so important um, for, for this type of artwork, for scientists to collaborate with artists because sometimes with art, um, it, like as an artist, I don't really have the resources to really examine the forensic evidence um, or the historical evidence um, for that matter. Like I can look at like history books, but there's like tens of thousands of government archives that I can look through. So that can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and I have looked through them uh, for some of these cases, but I think that, um, you know, being able to like, for example, if I was able to collaborate within um, a scientific or research institution, I might be able to get some of the students to actually look at the primary evidence documents. Uh, that way I wouldn't have to read all of them myself and I could still get that information. The other, yeah, um, and then we would be able to have that strong research focus while also having uh, playing to what are my strengths, which are to portraiture and actually telling the story. So by collaborating, we're able to get the research and um, to tell the story in a meaningful way. Um, and that doesn't always, you know, when you're focusing entirely on the research, sometimes it's difficult to, to take a step back and actually think about like, okay, what's the personal perspective? So with collaboration, we can achieve both. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, that's the last question we could take, but I want to um, go ahead, if you can uh, turn off screen share so you can see everybody. Um, uh, let's give some um, strong thanks some snaps to Paula for um, not the kind of content you usually get at a science conference, right? It's <laughs> not uh, upbeat, but it shouldn't be upbeat. Um, the world, we need to acknowledge these uh, actions have happened. We need to see the parallels in what's happening now. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to tell stories. We need to tell the stories of those whose stories aren't being told. And whether we do that with art, with art and science um, or other ways, um, storytelling, storytelling's key. So thank you again, Paula. So um, it's really great to have you. But now we're gonna pivot into a different kind of storytelling and a different kind of um, uh, look at things. Uh, Corinne uh, Okada-Takara is here. Um, 
Prin almost needs no introduction. She, she's been, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, very active in things today. She has been much like me, double booked most yeah. of the day. She was supposed to be the MC until I realized about 20 minutes ago, wait a minute, you can't MC when you're presenting. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's Thank go ahead you. and um, have Corinne uh, jump into things. So Corinne, awesome. you're up and I'm uh, your timekeeper. Cool. All right, so I'm just gonna start my clock. Um, so it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Paula, for your presentation. I think we need presentations like that, where we can percolate ideas on these topics that, as Mira said, are, are need to be in these spaces. Um, I'm going to be presenting today on indigenous innovation, reimagining food packaging for long sea voyages, leveraging the past, present, and future. So what I'm going to show you is a case study of how to engage Hawaiian youth in their own innovation of their traditional cultural practices through kind of starter activities. Um, and I'll get that to that in a moment, but um, it's a case study and it's a start of how to elevate multi-directional learning and also emphasize the idea that um, the kind of learning and making we do doesn't need to always be in the classroom. It doesn't always need to be um, so focus on what is considered technology, but also what is what is actually innovation. Um, and the Hawaiians have the most innovative innovations for how to do long sea voyages. And this project that I did engaged students in history to look at what their ancestors did to travel. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide if I can get my, oh shoot, let me get the present. Okay, there we go. Well, I'm not going to be in present mode, sorry. I'm just going to do it this way. Um, as Mira said, my name is Karen Okada Takara. Um, I'm an artist and STEAM educator. I work with youth. Um, I think another really important thing to know about me is I am one generation removed from life on a plantation on Maui. My father was born and grew up for much of his youth on a cane field in, in Maui. And my families were very thrifty makers learning from the Hawaiians and from Japanese culture. So I grew up learning that making and even biomaking was something you do in communion with others. They were very thrifty. They would make things out of the natural local materials, pinwheels from hibiscus flowers, boats from bamboo leaves, uh, all kinds of techniques from making lays from different materials and just really elevating the fact that when we make and the materials we use, they all have stories and the stories are actually core to what they are. So we need to elevate the stories, indigenous stories, of the materials that we're using and honor them. And so that's where one of the angles I come from. And then one more thing is I'm a daughter of a toy designer. And so I really believe in play in our making. And I think our students, our children, are not getting enough of that playful exploration. For getting into this project, um, I was invited to go to Punahou School in Hawaii. And it's a multi-generational private school. Um, and it's an amazing campus with indigenous plants all around it. There's breadfruit trees, tea leaf plants. They actually have planted uh, taro patches, indigenous plants everywhere. And yet many of these students don't know the names of the plants. And they don't know what's indigenous, what's invasive, and what's a canoe plant. And so Hawaii is different from other places where most places we will talk about endemic plants and invasive species. But in Hawaii, you also have canoe plants. And canoe plants are the plants that the original Polynesians brought to Hawaii, knowing that they wanted to terraform it with the foods that they wanted to grow. So the Kanaka Maoli, the indigenous Hawaiians, came with plants and animals that they knew that they could have in this space. And yet, even though we're now, now starting to see long sea voyages again um, in Hawaii, and I'm going to show you some of the, the food uh, lists of what they bring. The food packaging is modern. It's, it's taking cans of food with them. So the workshops that I did, these very short design sprints, was inviting students to reimagine using traditional materials what they would do for food packaging and how they would make it watertight. And that was an entry point conversation bringing in natural materials into the classroom, so this was done in a classroom, um, to elevate their knowledge of the, the existing, the plants in their communities and different ways of treating those materials in traditional and new, new ways, bridging contemporary biomaking 
with traditional biomaking. And I'm just going to be showing you some of the images from this. Um, on the left, you see some materials that were waxed because we were also doing encaustics, exploring how might we use encaustics. I run a biomaker space in my garage, and a lot of the work I do with communities is bio uh, is more makerspace oriented. The visual, the vocabulary that we use of our materials is really important. And so what I like to do, and what I did here in Hawaii when I went home, was bring materials into the makerspace, into the classroom, and mixed it with modern maker materials so that the students were forced to figure out, how do I use this material? My grandma might know, my grandfather might know. I'm struggling with this, I'm gonna go home and ask them. So I think it's really important to think about the materials we engage youth with and for them to go through an experience where they realize, oh, there's some crafts I might wanna learn so that I can actually build this thing, that I can do packaging and make it watertight. When we strive to elevate indigenous science, indigenous knowledge into our learning spaces, we need to think about some core things and to be mindful of. So not only do we need to expand the vocabulary of the materials to include indigenous plants traditionally, traditionally used in making, but we need to share the stories as Maria highlighted, stories are key. And so we need to create space in these maker experiences. I know that in, at least in the United States, a lot of times we have these design sprints and these maker journeys and they're really fast and they're compressed. But we need to give space to breathe for students to share their story of reconnecting with the materials that they have. And maybe a story from, from their home or how they know that the tea leaf lay is for healing um, and protection. And for them to exchange the knowledge that they have to make it a co-learning space where they can step in and share. Um, and then thirdly, we need to partner with indigenous educators. So I went to Hawaii, I worked with an indigenous a Hawaiian educator named Ka'ai, and I'll show you a picture of her soon. Um, and we both spent time bringing in the natural materials from our communities into the makerspace. So when we're imagining watertight materials that the Polynesians used, we need to bring in those materials and we need to bring in the indigenous voices. I also believe that these journeys really need to be low floor and high ceiling journeys. So what I mean by that, um, the educators in the room will know what this means, but it's like simple engagement activities that everyone feels they can do. And I'll show you in a moment what this journey is. It's really like you're making a wrapper for something that you're imagining a food you're taking with you on a long sea, sea voyage. And then you're gonna dunk it into a cooler full of water. That's a pretty low floor activity. But the high ceiling is you can continue on this journey in high school to really imagine system design. How did the Polynesians do their packaging? It wasn't just a package. It was a full system of food and community that was involved in creating these really effective systems for traveling long distances with their food. And then fifth, we need to create a space for blending new and old technologies that creates an equal footing to both. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm trying to get the next. Okay, so this is a, another example of being in this school space. I'd rather be outside when I'm doing this kind of making, but this was within the context of the school where they want us to be inside. So we have an encaustic tray on the left. Um, this high school student is dunking bacterial cellulose into the beeswax to change the material properties uh, of that so she could start working with creating her waterproof packaging. On the right is a student that knew how to twist. Uh, tea leaves and other materials in the traditional Hawaiian way. And it was really wonderful to see her take off her shoes. Oh, uh, not shoes, she had, everyone wears flip flops. Um, so actually when we're doing the encaustics, the kids had to switch their shoes around because there's like two kids in each class that had shoes. And safety precautions are that like, I just couldn't have anyone near hot wax without shoes. So it was really hilarious to see these pair of shoes kind of travel among the student teams. But anyway, barefoot is the norm. Um, and me, myself, growing up, you, f you use your feet when you make. So this is another thing. We need to change our lens of like the maker setting. We need to be able to sit on the floor for bringing in, in traditional indigenous methods. Uh, we're twisting with our twine on our toes. We're holding materials with our feet to sand it with another material. Um, this is the way of making. We need to put that on equal level and bearing with uh, more contemporary ways of making. I'm struggling with space are going forward. I'm so sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, the vocabulary of our materials is very important. 
So we brought in chopsticks. Students were invited to bring in other materials. This is a, a tea leaf wrapped around the chopsticks. So the challenge was, how do you, how do you make these connections work? Without tape, without hot glue. Uh, we did provide pipe cleaners so they could have some level of success with how to join these. But it elevated to them the importance of knowing how to do traditional twine work, how to, how to actually tie things in a traditional way. Uh, because they were asking and afterwards at the end. So these kind of engagements, these entry engagements and challenges um, are starting points for students to really look at their cultural practices as very valuable. Um, and this particular project on the right was actually not the um, waterproof one. This one we had gave teams of students, three tangerines, one each, and they had to design a container that was uh, sustainable. So this is for um, a lower grade. Here's kind of the part of the test flow. So here is the hot wax tray. Um, here's one of the team students starting to get ready to dunk the model. Here you can see a big sheet of banana leaf. And then this is how fiber. How fiber is, um, is a, uh, I believe a canoe plant that was brought to Hawaii. It's part of the hibiscus family. And you take the inner lining, inner bark, and you very carefully heat it, soak it, and pound it into these flat sheets that are really remarkable. Um, and then the final moment of truth, the students put a dry piece of sponge and put it inside their container. A lot of them were saying it was spam. I don't know if you know, but in Hawaii, spam is like very, very popular. <laughs> but we talk later about like, well, maybe we want to rethink the spam thing and think about something that's a little more uh, natural and, and local. And then they put their dry sponge inside their container and dunked it in the cooler. And they did this all as teams. So again, when we're talking about exploring indigenous practices and bringing that into the conversation, indigenous work in so many places, especially in Hawaii, is something done in community. It's done in communion. It's not a solo activity. And I just want to show you some of the pride on the faces of the students. Here's a student who was exploring with his team how to hold the three tangerines, and he was just so proud about figuring out how to create this, this design here. And on the right is a student sitting on the floor playing with the how fiber and the banana leaves. Again, this is in a classroom context where these students never get a chance to play with the natural materials or elevate them in any way. And then um, here's Ka'ai, and it was such a joy to work with her. She's a fourth grade teacher at Punahou, but she went to Kamehameha School, which is the Hawaiian school in um, Hawaii. You have to be a certain percentage of Hawaiian to attend. And she told me a very interesting story that her uncles, she had multiple uncles on this one side of her family, on her dad's side, and I believe one went to Kamehameha, but she said her other uncle stayed back on the island of Hawaii, was more, had a better schooling or learning in Hawaiian traditions. And it's not surprising because when you go into a school context, it's gonna be a different learning than you learn in place, out in an environment. And you're making and identifying the materials in the environment. And so it was, it was just a joy to work with her, to be in conversation about that with the students. And on the right is a drawing I did to show students and to highlight the incredible engineering and innovation that the Hawaiians had. So I'm just gonna share this really quickly with you. Um, these are torches that they made. And they actually use these on their voyage, long sea voyages as well, but they use a lot for night fishing. So what this is, is, a, is a, a piece of bamboo that has been split, so there's air ventilation. And then it has kukui nuts that have been skewered, they've been shelled, and skewered with palm frond, frond spines. They would light the top kukui nuts, and then they would drip, they're very oily. They would drip and ignite the next one and then ignite the next one down and ignite the next one down. So they could have this torch that lasted a long time and provided really good illumination. Just a great engineering feat and understanding of how um, the, the, the need for that air ventilation through that design. So highlighting that to the students I think is really important. And the context for these workshops was done in uh, very short sprints, but we introduced kind of the design thinking process and really focus on the empathizing part. So I asked them to think about who are the users of your food packaging? And of course it was indigenous Hawaiians and the Polynesians that were traveling across the sea to this unknown land that they, they knew might be there. But 
users of our packaging are also actually end users. We only use the plastic in our packages today for on an average of 12 minutes. And then our end users are sea turtles and all the creatures in the sea. And I usually bring in these two jars into class to show students to build that empathy of what the turtles see and all the sea creatures see. They will look at this jellyfish on the right and this plastic bag on the left and think they're the same thing. So that's why 50% of the sea turtles in the world have plastic in them because they think it's jellyfish. The other thing that is an opportunity to share with students and why packaging is a good thing to focus on is that 40% of the plastic produced is for packaging. And so while we're talking about indigenous innovation and we're looking back to how they uh, design their packaging for those long sea voyages, it has applications for today. So what are the packaging of today? So this is um, an example of the food that was carried on the Hokulea in 2014. And I highlighted in red um, the cans. So spam comes again, 70 cans of spam, 40 cans of tuna, Vienna sausage, pudding, mandarin oranges. These are all in cans and individual containers. There's a lot of trash here and I'd even highlight what comes in plastic bags. So in 2014, while the Hokulea traditional, um, it was built, these long sea boats are built in a traditional manner, and sailed in a traditional manner, the food was not. I'll show you the next. Okay. But more recently, Makali'i, they were doing Aipono food, healthy, delicious food that is traditional. So this is a different pathway. So I wanted students to also think about uh, what is the food that they're making and what's that system's design. So this most recent Hawaiian voyage, uh, they spent three years working with students in the Big Island, raising vegetables and chickens, uh, creating food in a traditional way. But again, they're preserving and freeze drying and dehydrating in a contemporary way. So what are those hybrid spaces that we can create for innovation design? Now let's look at the past. So I'm taking you through a journey of, of what I show the students about thinking about training this conversation, how do we design? So the Polynesians were systems designers. They were the masters of the sea of long sea voyage. Uh, they knew how to do this in such an incredible way. They would bring small farms into the boats. They would fish from the boats. They would drag coconuts behind. They would use the shells of the coconuts after they ate them. And on the left, you can see very innovative uses of um, uh, twine and the way they've created containers, but also the food prep. So breadfruit was prepared and fermented. So a lot of food was fermented ahead of time. Four minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Two minutes, okay, so let me go a little faster. Okay, so I uh, also wanna highlight that in these workshops, thank you, Maria. <laughs> um, uh, it's great to bring in modern uh, innovation. So bioplastics uh, we use in the workshop and elevated those as materials that they can use alongside the traditional materials. So chitin bioplastic, agar agar bioplastic, um, and highlighting that these are actually edible as well. So I you always use food grade materials in these projects. And then they did a structural test and dumped it in the water. Again, this is a low floor activity, but could have high ceiling applications. Uh, and this just kind of shows you an example of the modern, modern materials for the teens, um, youth being used in conjunction with the traditional materials. And this slide I think really captures for me the importance even within a short classroom time. Uh, ideally, I would have liked to have a long time. Emphasizing the idea of communion and working together. And that is essential for innovation design. And in that we, if we look at indigenous cultures, we can see and highlight that incredible importance of collaboration um, in our journeys of innovation. And I also want to mention, uh, this is a different workshop, but the importance of cross-generational. So when we're talking about using, working with traditional cultures, it's really, really important um, to engage a whole family. So where do we go from here? We really want to build connections with local experts. And this is a slide I show the students. What's next? You have this short little journey of playing with materials and learning a little bit of history, sharing your knowledge. Where might you go from now? And a lot of them said that they wanted to have more experience with the materials uh, because it wasn't something they had um, in their engineering classes at school. 
Uh, whoops. And then I just want to also share this. Okay, about high ceiling, low floor, high ceiling. So with my experience in doing weaving and lahala mats and traditional Hawaiian methods of making, um, I think all that informs the engineering work that I do. So this is a compliant mechanism that shrinks over time as the bioplastic shrinks. Um, but if you look at the right, this would only happen if I had that experience. Thank you, Ria. I think I made it. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Q&A. <laughs> you guys, I'm punchy. Let me... Okay, so yeah, let me exit screen share. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and give it up for Corinne, <laughs> who has been doing a ton of talking today. So I think she's starting to forget which session she's in. Um, I'm sorry, I a little later from me listening to the Norwell talk on um, one of my other devices that isn't muting entirely. Um, all right, so we have about uh, three minutes left, so I can take one or two short questions. But thank you so much, Corinne. I love the idea of learning what these um, indigenous folks did that it was really innovative because we don't give um, uh, these folks enough uh, credit. And I think we really discredit them when we talk about them. So questions from anybody, go ahead and jump in. We, you can unmute yourself um, if you have a quick question for Corinne. Go ahead and go, Corinne. Go ahead, Omar. Great job. Um, and just quick question, I guess, how, uh, how transferable do you think this method and this, like what you did with the, with the youth to other communities, other cultures, um, and, and in different environments with different materials, like how, do you see that as something that's replicable, something you can transfer and utilize in different communities? That's a great question. I think it is, and I, but I think it requires collaboration. Like I was able to say yes to doing this in Hawaii because I have an understanding. So if this was done in another community, you really need to, you know, we need to, and I also partner with a whole indigenous Hawaiian. So I think that's a prerequisite is to really partner with the community and build those relationships and then engage in a conversation of like, what, what do you think would be a good entry point to this conversation? What's a good anchor project that can elevate um, the knowledge of a community to its own children? Yeah, thank you, Omar. I hope that was coherent. <laughs> It was coherent. Now, I have a question for the audience. How many of you want to go to Hawaii right now? <laughs> I think we, I, that was one of my big, I'm like, your beautiful photos of Hawaii. That was like, I kept getting distracted from the tech by like, I want to be in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and again, just say thank you, Corinne. That was really inspiring. I love the work you do with your BioJam kids and the way that you um, incorporate the ideas of um, old tech with biotech. Um, using the ideas of, you know, weaving with biomaterials, what do we have to learn um, with all this? So it's um, really inspiring work and work that we should be seeking to do um, in our own spaces is tying the old back with the new and not just thinking it's all about the new. Thank you, Maria. All right. So up next, we have Shreya. Shreya has joined us. Uh, I'm really, really excited to have Shreya here. Shreya is a uh, been a student um, at BioCurious in a couple of our different community projects for several years. So I think I've known her since she was an eighth grader and you are a 10th grader now. So um, Shreya is going to be uh, talking to us now and I will be timing things for you. So um, I'm not going to cut your time any. So let's go ahead and jump into this. So you are a go. All right. Um, can you see my slides? We sure can. Go ahead and introduce yourself like you always do every week at BioCurious. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shreya Anand. I am a sophomore here in the Bay Area, and I am really interested in anything related to STEM, as you'll see um, in my talk. <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to be talking more um, from a story perspective, um, based off things that I've experienced and things that I've seen, uh, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So to start off a little bit of background, high schoolers are absolutely clueless. And the only reason I can say that so confidently is because I'm one of them. There's an interesting progression in education in the US that seems pretty common. Everything seems fine until you hit high school. That's when the heat really starts to pick up. Suddenly you're expected to be doing calculus, 
writing in Spanish, speaking perfect English, and memorizing the sequence of events that caused the French Revolution, all while managing your extracurriculars and your social life. And the biggest bomb drops when you introduce the big word, college. Now for me, I've always been interested in STEM and public speaking, whether it was studying different kinds of plants and synthesizing new compounds or doing competitive speech and dramatics. But as I've gotten older, I've struggled to identify what exactly I want to do because I realized you can't really be a full-time biochemist and president of the United States. It just doesn't work out. So I realized that I need to kind of focus in on what I want to do. I do research at a lab and I'm also a part of BioCurious Community Lab here in the Bay Area under Maria studying dwarf cuttlefish. So I know that there are so many options in STEM and I couldn't help but be interested in almost every single one. In addition to that, I also wanted a way to incorporate speech and rhetoric into my future career. Every time I thought of a new idea for what I wanted to do, I was faced with a million doubts about if I would be good enough and if it would be the right decision. Considering the specificity of my interests, I thought it would be understandable that I had almost no role models for women who had faced similar situations in STEM. So I decided to seek out role models for myself. And I figured that there are probably many other girls like me who wanted this information. So I started a podcast called All About Her, where I interview women in STEM to learn more about their careers and experiences in an effort to help myself and other young people figure out what they want to do with their lives. <laughs> The strange thing was that many of the women I interviewed, despite being incredibly successful, felt the same feelings I was experiencing as a lost high schooler. The main one being the feeling of not being good enough and not belonging. This is called imposter syndrome, for those of you that don't know. Something experienced by many people, mainly underrepresented groups in a field. I only have one slide for you today, so that's how you know it's going to be really important. This statistic right here, 93.3% of women. What does this mean? This is the percent of the 15 women I've interviewed so far that have felt that they've experienced imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. That means more or less 15 I'm sorry, 14 out of every 15 women in STEM have dealt with imposter syndrome. That's absolutely crazy. I didn't realize it at the time, but as I started to interview more women, the same idea kept coming up and I realized that it was because of gender inequality. Most STEM fields are male dominated. In fact, only a bit more than a quarter of people in STEM are women not even taking into account the even more discouraging statistics for women in leadership positions. The scary thing about imposter syndrome is that it kind of creeps up on you. There is no outright inequality. It's a mindset that's ingrained itself into the minds of people without anyone ever noticing. It's like being controlled by an invisible force. Like with gravity, you don't really know it's there until you fall flat on your face and it hits you really hard. This is why I never realized that it was gender inequality until I started speaking to more women. It's one of those things that you have to talk about to realize that you aren't in fact crazy and many other people are in the same situation. A few other things I noticed was the fear of standing out and the lack of female role models in STEM across the board, whether it's in education or actually doing research. The vicious cycle seems impossible to break, especially when you're in it. I remember being in grade school and there was no real distinction. People freely signed up for whatever classes they wanted and didn't fear being judged. But now as classes are getting harder, I'm seeing fewer and fewer girls joining advanced STEM classes, not because they're not capable, but because they have the same excuse. I'm not good enough. The evil monster imposter syndrome just keeps showing up, planting seeds of doubt in everyone's heads. I'm incredibly privileged in the sense that I've been pushed by my peers, my family, and my teachers to continue through these difficult times and tell the evil monster to take a hike. But this isn't possible for everyone, unfortunately. Until we as a society begin to acknowledge and talk about these issues more, there's no way we can defeat it. 
So now you're probably thinking, okay, Shreya, I get that imposter syndrome exists, but how can we get rid of it? I put together some advice from the women I've spoken to so far. First, we should be bold and try new things. Even the most successful people have had to experiment and fail to find their passions. How fitting for STEM. <laughs> I know women who have found their passions only when they were in their 30s or 40s, and some haven't even found it yet. So you aren't under any kind of time constraint. It's different for everybody. And I've spoken to women from a variety of backgrounds, some starting from musical, educational, and political backgrounds that somehow found a way to tie that to STEM. Second, you should never question your qualifications. If you're hired for a job, for example, revel in that. Don't think you don't deserve it just because someone else might have more experience. The truth is, there was a reason you were hired, so don't let that go. Finally, we have to build an environment of positivity and support. For example, I was so excited when I started a math club at school with all the officers being girls instead of all boys like I was so used to seeing. By speaking out about gender inequality, I want to normalize talking about these issues to help other people realize that there are so many people out there that they can reach out to and understand. I wanna leave everyone with one last idea that I got from a climate scientist that I spoke to. When going to work doesn't feel like you're doing a job anymore and you look forward to it every day, that's when you know you found your passion. You should never let go of that. And hopefully with all of this advice together, us high schoolers won't be as clueless anymore and we'll all be able to break out of the powerful rule of imposter syndrome. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So what do you think? I'm hearing some good comments in the um, chat there. Uh, who wants a 10th grader as your personal motivation speaker? <laughs> All right, so if you stop uh, screen sharing, um, let's go ahead and give some snaps for Shreya. All right, Shreya. And you know what? I've got two of her because she has a little sister who is now a fifth grader who has been with us since third grade. Um, who is very similar, <laughs> who can do PCR and all that kind of stuff too. So um, yeah, we can take one question for Shreya and Shreya, everybody wants to know where your podcast is. So make sure you put it in here. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the big thing here is to talk about issues. Uh, I think that she brought up some really good points. We don't fix issues by not talking about them. So I think, you know, um, equality in STEM and equality in life for women um, and those who are left out of a lot of things, whether it's uh, women, LGBTs, the indigenous communities, um, whatever marginalized communities they are, we need to talk about these issues um, and let people know they're real. So I think that's a really great first step and uh, very inspiring to see our high schoolers so socially aware. This generation, man, well, I'm not feeling hopeless this year. These kids. <laughs>